I frequently find myself in the company of other family members like myself, um, family members who lost a loved one on September 11th, 2001. You see, that morning, my big brother, Joe, went to work early. He worked on the 103rd floor of the North Tower for Cantor Fitzgerald. <clears throat> and at 8.46 in the morning, Joe disappeared into thin air. It's within conversations with these other family members that they'll sometimes mention the fact that they had a sign, a butterfly, a rainbow, even a series of events that they pieced together themselves to convince themselves that they were in the presence of their loved one or working the work, uh, watching the workings of their loved one. And I would always smile politely, nod my head in acknowledgement that they were speaking to me. But in my mind, honestly, I was rolling my eyes. I'm a very pragmatic, logical, methodical thinker. I need proof. Even within my plumbing profession, we think of a problem in a ladder pattern and we don't reach for the next rung until we have the answer to the first. I'm also somebody that was haunted by a horrible reoccurring nightmare that began shortly after September 11th. It would always begin with me standing at the base of a mountain looking up. In front of me was a wide swath of a path. The path was all stone, rocks, outcroppings, on the right side was a definitive line of trees. On the left side, the same. On these outcroppings were these creatures. They were dog-like, vicious, horrible, dark creatures, and they scared the hell out of me. Even when I looked at them, everything would turn dark. They were vicious. They would snarl and snap at the air, I would see the mist from their breath. And at the top of the mountain was my brother Joe. And he never said a word. And without fail, somewhere along my climb, I would slip and helplessly slide into the grasp of one of these creatures. And for some reason, I gave a green light to all the other creatures to set upon me. And I would awaken as they were tearing at me. I would sometimes awaken hearing a voice or a scream, and as I became more awake, I would realize it was my own. I'd usually be sitting up, covered in sweat, scared where I couldn't even formulate a word. Then I'd be confused, then I'd get angry, and then I'd become depressed. In 2006, I was approached by a group called Tuesday's Children. It's a group that was formed in the days after September 11th, and I'm very active with them. And they wanted to know if I was interested in going on a Colorado outward bound adventure with other family members. And I jumped at the chance. I was always an outdoors person, loved the nature. And then August, we all made our way to Leadsville, Colorado the highest incorporated city in the nation, over two miles up into the air. And we spent the first two days getting acclimated to camp life, to each other, and especially the altitude. And on the third day, we packed up and we began our trek into the deep woods. And almost immediately, we came upon a river. And there was an older gentleman fly fishing. And even though I told him I had no fishing gear, he still insisted on giving me a fishing fly. And he said, this will work in these waters. And I shrugged my shoulders and thanked him for his gift, and we continued our hike. And that hike was what I consider one of my life's beautiful moments. A beautiful moment to me is defined by when your brain is consciously aware of what you're doing or what you're seeing is in some inexplicable way extra special. And you will remember that. It's as if your brain makes a wrinkle for that memory and it'll never go away. And we continued hiking. It was after lunch and we were hiking along a stream and we came upon a huge log jam. 
that made a natural bridge over the stream, and we used that to get ourselves and our gear over, and we climbed up a small embankment through a small clearing into the woods a short distance, and we set up another base camp that was going to be our home for the next few days. And little Jimmy got a long, flexible stick, got my 12 yards of dental floss, and my new gift of the fishing fly, and I was going to go back to that stream, and I was going to catch some fresh dinner. And when I came out of the woods into the clearing, now I was facing that log jam again. But from this vantage point, I could see what was beyond that log jam. It was a huge, steep mountain. It had a huge, wide swath of a path cut from the bottom to the top. There was a definitive line of trees on the right, a definitive line of trees on the left. I immediately became frozen because I knew this was the mountain in my nightmare. This was Joe's mountain. I wanted to call out to the others, but I had never told anybody but my wife about this nightmare. So I didn't say a word. In fact, a short time after September 11th, when I would speak of my brother Joe to even my closest friends, I would see them become comfortably, un, uh, physically uncomfortable. And so, to save their discomfort, I stopped talking about my brother. That night after dinner, we built a campfire. And you could probably imagine there was a... With all those broken-hearted people, there was a lot of emotional kumbaya moments around that campfire. There was a lot of crying. There was a lot of anger. When it was my turn to speak, I told the others about my nightmare. And that's when we learned from the guide that that was one of the mountains we were scheduled to climb. That very next morning, we put on our day packs and we sat out at dawn. And it was a crisp, clear, beautiful morning. And we hiked for hours. And we got about halfway up when I have what I consider to be a complete breakdown. For some reason, I went from crying to wailing, to dropping on my knees, and making guttural sounds I had never made before. The others with me were great. They hugged me, they cried with me. And together we got to the top of that mountain. <laughs> And let me tell you, the top of the mountain was absolutely glorious. It was spectacular. On the top of that mountain, we found a pickle jar that somebody had left up there with folded up notes inside of it. I found a pen and paper, and I wrote down my thoughts and prayers to my brother Joe. One thing I will tell you is that I wrote that I would never let him be forgotten. You know, reliving this nightmare for you, the nightmare that I was asleep for, and especially the one I was awake for, is <laughs> uncomfortable. But something more, I hope, happens. If you all remember my story, even if you remember my nightmare, you will, in a small way, remember my brother Joe. And maybe, maybe I'll create a little wrinkle in your brains tonight for Joseph M. Giacconi. And he will not have vanished into thin air. As you might have guessed, after that I never had that nightmare again. On that mountain that day, I found my proof. Thank you very much.